Um, I work collaboratively with Roma and have worked with Roma for 40 years, but one thing I'm trying to build toward is to have a Romani speaker here. That would be my ideal of being collaborative. But I've worked with Roma for 40 years, and to me this is a very, very important question about why we don't know about the Roma Holocaust when we have Holocaust Weeks and we have memorials. And I think what I can offer is what I would call the long perspective, that is both a historic perspective but also bringing you to the present. Because the situation for Roma in the contemporary <coughs> world is actually really bad and probably even getting worse. So the big question we want to ask is why focus on the Roma Holocaust in general? So a few different answers come to mind immediately. First of all, Roma, like Jews, were specifically targeted for extermination. And many people do not know that. Uh, the number of victims is controversial, but we can say for sure that it was over 250,000, probably up to a half of million people. Now, why don't we even know how many? Well, we don't even know how many Roma existed before the war. Because of the stigma of being gypsy, they were passing as other groups, and they also were, some were nomadic and did not count, get counted in census. So what we know so far about the numbers have to do with what the um, regimes, the, the, the Third Reich and the Nazi socialism uh, provided us, and testimonies as well. We do know that, in general, probably over 50% of the Roma population perished. In some areas of Europe, it was higher. In Germany and Estonia, 80 to 90%. Okay, so this is something that just cannot be ignored. Yet there is this invisibility, and we have to ask ourselves why. Because for the last 10 and even 20 years, we do have good scholarship, and yet it still doesn't become mainstream. So that's the question of who owns history, how is memory constructed, wh who is in charge of building memorials, commemorations, and so on. OK, so what I think I can offer is a little bit of this historic perspective. And unfortunately, it is a very long history of persecution and of stereotypification. So I'm going to go through that with you. And then I'm going to take you through the Holocaust. And then I'm going to take you up to the present day. So that's my goal for today. And unfortunately, some of the present statistics are even more frightening than the past statistics. So according to the European Union, According to the European Union Fundamental Rights Agency, in their reports that were consistently published in the last few years, not just one report, but many different surveys, 80% of European Roma today still live at the risk of poverty, and one in three face harassment, mostly physical harassment. And today they are the largest minority in Europe, numbering between 10 and 12 million. And again, we don't have exact statistics because many Roma pass as other ethnic groups to get out of the category gypsy, which is stigmatized. A little bit closer to home, we could start with Roma in the Northwest, because we have Roma here that are historic Roma from the turn of the century. I'm talking about the 1890s, 1910, first coming from the East Coast, East European Roma that look like this in a Seattle photograph. And the Seattle Post Intelligencer um, wrote about this. This is from 1937. Though they hadn't violated any laws, and three of the nine were just babies, this group of Romani were arrested for belonging to traditionally a nomadic ethnic group then known as gypsies. A detective explained that the arrest policy was a shortcut to preventing a lot of shoplifting, money blessing, and fortune telling, all crimes stereotypically associated with members of this ethnic group. Nowadays, this strategy of preemptive arrest could be considered racial profiling. So there are many, many parallels in different places around the world about persecution. OK, so that's that quote uh, there. So I want to start with some very basic things uh, historical. So why am I using the word Roma when the Nazis used Zigeuner, when Slavic people say Tsigani, when we in English use the word gypsy, when Spanish people say Gitano, and here are some other names. 
Okay, so the, ro the name for Roma by themselves, for themselves, in their own language, is Roma. It means people, okay? The singular male is Rom, a married female is Romni, um, a adjective is Romani, the language is Romanes, okay? There are many outsider terms that have been given to this, these people. So we can start with the one gypsy, and that comes from Egyptian. So these people are not Egyptians, okay? But it is perhaps um, the label that was given to them because they came from an area that was sometimes, or they passed through an area that was sometimes known as Little Egypt, that is the Middle East on their journey from India, and I'll get to India a little bit later on. So some European people in the English language refer to them as Egyptians, okay? And there are um, equivalents in other European languages, such as Hitano or Egyptiani in Albania, in Macedonia, Montenegro, and so on. The word Zigeuner in the German language, just like Zigani or Zigane, all come from the same root, a different etymolog etymological root, and that is Atsinganoi, which is a, a heretical group in the Byzantine Empire that meant an outsider. Again, a misnomer. It does not apply to Roma at all. They were just given a, a name in the Byzantine Empire that indicated they were outsiders, okay? And these two names, Gypsy and Sigoiner, are considered a, an ethnic slur. In many, many proverbs in, Engl in European languages, these things mean something bad. In the English language, to gyp means to swindle somebody, okay? So the very word itself is an insult. And we in Voice of Roma and other organizations I work with have worked hard to try to make um, English speakers aware of the impact of that word and to actually not use it for a gypsy cab or gypsy music that isn't anything to do with Roma or just somebody who wanders around. It's very widespread in terms of the stereotypes in the English language, okay? Some of the other words are interesting though. Sinti is a word that is used by insiders, a group of Roma that arrived in Germany, or actually Central Europe, in about the 1200s, and we think that they called themselves Sinti because of the Sin Valley in India, because they're from India. For whatever reason, this name stuck, and they actually prefer it over the word Roma, although they are part of the worldwide Roma migration from India, okay? Same for the word manush, which means a man in Romani, uh, as well as rom, manush means a, a person as well. And that's the name given to uh, this group of Roma in southern Spain and mostly southern France. If you've heard of manush jazz or, quote, gypsy jazz, that's where that comes from. In other places, they were called Outsiders, meaning somebody from over the border. So in the Czech lands, they were called Bohemians, meaning if, if you were from over there in the mountain. In Finland, the Tatade, somewhere from over near Russia. So a lot of words from the outside, but a few that Roma have used for themselves. I also want to mention that the word traveler is a different ethnic group, and they are Irish people who have a different ethnic origin. Whoops. We are moving, losing that. Did we get that? Okay. Um, different ethnic origin, but uh, Irish travelers intermarried with Roma who are from India who came up through England, and sometimes there are groups called traveler gypsies in Scotland, for example. Okay? Sometimes the groups are confused. Um, so the largest concentrations today are in Eastern Europe and Spain, but we have a million Roma in the U.S., the historic stereotypes are very consistent, and there's two big groups of them. First, the romantic, which is about freedom and about musicality and beauty and being in touch with spirituality. And you'd think, what's wrong with all of these? Well, there's a lot wrong with them because not everybody is a musician. People are not free to roam around. People work, but yet they're assumed to be nomadic. So there's a lot wrong with stereotypes that are even positive, okay? And th this is a very 
uh, dynamic st stereotype in America today. I've had lots of arguments with people who, who call their stores gypsy, bohemian clothing or whatever, and they're just saying, oh yes, I'm evoking the spirit of beauty and the spirit of uh, the wildness. And I'm saying, well, do you know that there are real people who like have jobs in that category? They don't want to be associated with your version of them in your fantasy mind. The other thing is that the romantic stereotype goes hand in hand with the criminal. The criminal is never far behind the fantasy. So, although you might admire the free spirit, the person who roams around, it's always, well, that person isn't really working. That person is not really a member of society and contributing. That person might pick your pocket. That person might steal your child. The stealing of children is a very old stereotype. And it is still true today. And I'll show you some news reports from last month about that. So when I ask my students, I just say the word gypsy on the first day of class. And I ask them to write down where, what comes to their mind when I just say that word, OK? I ask them to not be scholarly, not remember anything from school, just remember uh, uh, what they have kind of evoked in that word. They all have learned everything about Roma from one film, this Disney film, OK? So popular culture is very, very important in education, OK? So this kind of stereotype of the nomad, the seductress, is really old, OK? So here is a, um, from the European uh, Roma and Sinti Holocaust curriculum from the European um, Commission, uh, a a, an, a really old photo from the early 20th century of Roma kind of dancing around the fire. There's caravans. Apparently, these people don't really have to work. They're just having a good time all day long. And you might think, OK, yes, this is a long time ago. But here's something that I discovered. Whoops, I just lost this. Hold on. Did somebody help me? Let me just push it in. We lost her. Oh, there it is. OK, great. I'll just make sure I'm OK here. This is from the Knoxville, Tennessee Opera, an elite opera company that we protested several years ago. Because they were putting on Carmen, and they decided to have a benefit called Gypsies, Tramps, and Thieves from the Cher song. And they invited people to dress up as gypsies, and they were going to have fortune telling to raise money. OK, so this is from the Knoxville Opera. This is a very, very powerful stereotype that does not go away. And closer to home, here in Portland, in Oregon, we protested a gypsy crime class that was paid for by your tax dollars uh, by private detectives who run trainings for police departments in various kinds of crime. And one of the things they specialize in is gypsy criminality. Okay? Imagine if they had Jewish criminality or Korean criminality, imagine the ruckus that would ha what happen. So we protested this, and it actually was canceled. But we, we got the literature, and this happens around the country with um, private investigators getting hired by police departments. The National Association of Bunko Investigators had the introduction to gypsy criminal and travelers, assuming that all fortune tellers are frauds, all um, people telling fortunes or doing any spiritual advice are gypsies, and all of them are frauds. Okay? They even divided it up. The Yugoslavians specialize in this, store diversion burglary. The Romani astound you with their bold boldness. The travelers are a growing entity. So this is racial profiling brought to you by your law enforcement. Okay? So now I want to turn the clock back and talk about where Roma are from and how they ended up in different places in their diaspora. So Roma have an Indian origin. This is absolutely proven by their language. Their language, Romanes, is a Sanskrit-related language. It's even related to modern Hindi. And it is still a living language. More than half of the world's Roma still speak Romani, which is 
an amazing fact in itself, considering persecution and the kinds of attacks against their culture. Okay? But however, we, we have many different waves of migration. We actually don't know much about the actual migration of Roma, how it happened, and when it happened, and why it happened. We think around the year 1100, various groups of Roma left India, perhaps following on the heels of Muslims moving, perhaps as a kind of maybe uh, secular force with military, attached to the military units. We actually really don't know. But we have very good evidence that they arrived, for example, in Turkey, somewhere in the 1300s, in the Balkans, late 1300s, and then all throughout Europe, and reached England by the 1400s. Okay, so we have definitely sightings, and the kinds of occupations they have are, were sighted back then. I'll get to that in a minute. Now, there are many, many um, periods of persecution in different waves. Uh, throughout the years, but I also, I don't have time to mention all of them, but I do want to mention a few of them, okay? So first is the period of slavery. Uh, most people do not know that Roma were slaves. They were enslaved in Wallachia and Moldavia, the southern part of Romania and the northeast part of Romania between the 1300s and the 1860s, okay? So that's hundreds of years, okay? Like 500 years. They were owned officially, documented, and traded at auctions by the church, the Eastern Orthodox Church, by the state, <coughs> the Romanian principalities, and by the nobility. And they were categorized according to occupation. So it is important to understand how some of these occupations became actually kind of formulaic to them. Maybe even against their will, okay? So metal crafting is one of the older occupations. Horse trading, horse doctoring, meaning healing horses, music and dance, animal training, that means like training bears to dance, monkeys to dance, circus work, acrobatics, and those occupations later on got adapted to various historical regions, such as in the US, when Roma started coming from Eastern Europe after slavery ended in about the 18, it ended in the 1860s, there was an out-migration from Romania, there were Roma in other parts of Europe as well, but many started to come to the US from Eastern Europe between 1880 and 1920, along with the other East Europeans, uh, Jews, Southern Europeans, okay? We do have Roma from earlier periods in the US, from the British Empire. They sent people who were undesirables to America in the colonies. So we have British Roma in the US from the colonial period as well. But what's interesting is that some of these occupations in the US were very resonant with U.S. populations. So U.S. peasantry at the time needed metal work. If you had, this is before stainless steel, remember? So you had to have your pots re-tinned and all of that for the loom, for your horses, for your carts and all that. And then when cars got introduced, the Roma very cleverly switched over to body and fender work. And all the men in the largest group in the U.S., the Calderash, were body and fender workers and also car dealers. So they took their transportation skills from horses and their metal skills and combined them and became kind of car salesmen and car repair people. Okay? So some of these uh, uh, jobs depended on nobility, uh, on mobility, excuse me. So when we say that no Roma are nomadic, that really isn't true. First of all, we don't know what they were when they came. We know they have been evicted and forced to move. We do know that they, when they are allowed to settle, many Roma have settled. So when the Nazi period began, began over half of the German and the Central European Roma were totally settled. In the Ottoman Empire, the majority of Roma were settled but some of their occupations required mobility, and some of the states forced them to move. Okay, so each group has to be seen separately in terms of its history. 
So in terms of historical persecution, we can find these patterns from the very beginning. Evictions, restrictions on where they could even camp, even licenses to kill them in the Austro-Hungarian Empire. If you, they're on your property, you can shoot them and make them go away. The Austro-Hungarian Empire had a specific policy for Roma, and that was to assimilate them. That meant getting rid of their culture, language, and breaking up families. So they took children away from their parents and gave them to non-Romani parents, okay? Prohibited the language and so on. Very similar to what has happened with Native Americans and other uh, targeted groups. Professor Ian Hancock, who is of Romani descent, wrote a very interesting book. You can find it online, the whole book called The Pariah Syndrome. I think he aptly named that book. And he's one of the few Roma well-educated professors to have a university job in America, and I work with him very closely. So in general, in terms of othering, we could say that both Jews and Roma are Europe's historic others. Now, there are many others that are, are more contemporary, Muslims and refugees in general. But the historic others, I really think we would have to say these groups. And both, we would have to say, were integral to European economies in different ways. In fact, even in specialized monopolistic trades, okay? So here we, we're getting closer to the Nazi period. This, again, is from the European, um, Euro the European Commission curriculum on Roma and Sinti, uh, put together by Gerhard Baumgarten, um, a, an Austrian historian. So this is um, the European Roma in the Austrian territories. Most of them were actually settled. So this says when the photo was taken, there were 200 people who had jobs and who were metal workers, musicians, and so on. And they were pretty much integrated into either um, rural or even urban life, okay? Now, when the Holocaust policy started to be formed, um, there was no word for it in the Romani language, okay? And only after the Holocaust did Roma scholars and activists decide to invent a word, create a word because they felt that the word Holocaust in English was kind of already claimed, and actually they were excluded from a lot of Holocaust memorials, commemorations, museums. So they created the word poraimos, and it means devouring. Okay, it means devouring in the Romani language. There are a few other words as well, but this is the one that has kind of been accepted. Okay, so when we talk about segregation measures, when we talk about persecution, it did not start with the Nazis. It resonated with the Nazis. They took it to the nth degree, but all the elements were there before, and they continue to be there. So if there's one message I'm trying to say over and over again is that the Nazi period was not unique, and that's why we're here <coughs> taking note of it. So what are some of the measures in the Nazi period, okay? All the terminology about being asocial, about being criminal. Why wait for a child to grow up when we can just jail him now or exterminate him or sterilize his mother because that child will be a criminal? This was all part of racial policies. So first you had segregation measures. You had the Nuremberg race laws, which were specifically targeted for Jews and Roma, n not allowing them to marry other kinds of people, okay? Potentially dangerous, going to be criminals, okay? And little by little through the years, papers taken away, citizenship revoked, race identity cards. So it started in the German territories, and you have to remember, again, the word Sinti are those Roma who are historically in the German, Austrian, Central European territories, okay? And so if you see Sinti and Roma a lot in official terminology, that's why, because they want to use the word Sinti, and we respect them and use it as a double terminology, 
okay? So like Jews, Sinti and Roma were forced to wear yellow armbands. Roma wore zigoiner, that same word that comes from that Byzantine outcast etymology. One thing that we don't actually know, and I'm going to try to uh, emphasize here maybe the lesser known parts of the Holocaust period, even for Roma scholars, is that there was a Roma middle class. Not all Roma, even though they were by and far poor and uh, persecuted, many did manage to reach the middle class. So if Roma were talented musicians, they could make a career out of that. That would be their profession, and they would be employed for, at weddings, at cafes every weekend, and that was a good income from them. So when the Nazis targeted the Sinti, they were actually targeting the highest number of middle class Roma at the time and wiped them out, basically, okay? So that the different segments of the population survived in different ways during the war, okay? So many Roma served in the military. Roma were involved in sports. Here's a very interesting Romani man, and I, I mention him because his, um, autobi his biography was written by another Roma person. We don't have that much written by Roma, but this is written by a, um, an activist in Washington, D.C., who's part Romani background, and he wrote about Jonathan, um, jo I'm sorry, Johann Trollmann. That was his German name, but in Romani he was called Rukeli, which means a little tree. And he was a boxer. And if you know anything about the Nazi sport system, they were very much into boxing. But even within boxing, they persecuted him. They called him a gypsy dancer. They didn't let him win the titles that he won, according to everybody, even the judges. He would win, and then the next day they would invalidate it. So again, it was kind of, he was making it in the world, but also being persecuted at the same time. And at the end, he was deported to a concentration camp, and um, he was made to box with many, many SS officers. And in 1944, he was murdered in uh, Wittenberger. Um, one interesting thing he did, which is really defiant, is during one of his fights, he painted his face white, okay? Roma are a South Asian population, okay? So they tend to be dark, not all Roma. But in order to kind of show that either he could be white or that this whiteness was all ridiculous, he actually painted his face white to kind of show his defiance, okay? So I've been alluding to what we're calling the racial policies of uh, the Nazi regime. Some of the early policies were really crazy, and they did a lot of research on what kind of Roma are you? Are you a half-breed, a quarter-breed? Then they said certain ones have certain tendencies for certain crimes. In Germany, the half-breeds were targeted outside Germany, the ones who are nomadic. It was like a science of race differentiation in order to control and then persecute people, okay? And later on, many of these distinctions disappeared. Anything, any tie that you had to being Roma was enough to have you murdered. But there was an entire um, apparatus by the Third Reich about race, racial hygiene and eugenics, and it was done under the name of science, people who are psychologists, people who are anthropologists, measuring skulls. Here's the, the head of the unit, uh, Dr. Robert Ritter, speaking to a Romani woman. They measured things physiologically, but then they also collected um, genealogical data. And I have a few slides on that, um, I believe. So here's um, the racial science unit, again, uh, Dr. Ritter. Uh, he's collecting blood, okay? They kind of moved from physical to genealogy, and they were trying to ferret out every single person who had any type of Roma uh, connection. 
And here's some of the genealogical charts that they had. This was a hypothetical chart where they had um, what would happen if a German person married a Roma, what kind of crimes would result by certain marriages, OK? So this was very accepted science at the time to prove inferiority. And Roma were very much involved in it, and of course Jews as well. Some people ask, were there any Roma in the big ghettos? Okay, we have some very good evidence from Łódź in Poland. Okay, so um, we know that there are, were at the largest point there were 100,000 Jews and about 5,000 Roma there. Um, the conditions were really bad. The Roma reports we have were about 40 people to one small bedroom living there. What's interesting is the demography of this. The deportations before the Roma were brought to this ghetto included all able-bodied working people. So who was left to go to the ghetto? It was like 60% children and the elderly. And within about one week, a typhoid epidemic broke out in Woods, and 640 people died all at once. This is the Roma reports I have. The Nazis decided, oh, we might as well just get rid of all the Roma. So they took them out to the woods, Helmno, a place called Helmno, where now is one of the largest mass graves ever identified in World War II, okay, in 1942. So again, we, have, we know a lot about where Roma were and what happened to them, but it doesn't get disseminated in curriculums, memorials, and so on. We also know Roma uh, were involved in the notorious medical experiments of Joseph Mengele, the doctor who experimented in Auschwitz-Birkenau and his famous twin studies of sewing together <laughs> twins and injecting them with malaria and exchanging parts of their body. Really horrific experiments and children as well and Roma children as well. We also know that on the Eastern Front, um, there were mobile death squads who specifically targeted Roma, these kind of moving trucks that had shooting squads in them, and people were brought out into the forest. The other place in Eastern Europe that is pretty notorious in terms of Roma um, is Jasenovac, which I visited several times. It's in Croatia, and it is the place where the Ustasha, the um, occupied Croatian regime of the Nazis, um, herded Serbs, Roma, other asocials. It was a specific asocial place. There were Jews there too, but not a majority of Jews. The conditions were terrible, and just to tell you what the conditions are now, the museum there is in disrepair. Nobody is visiting it. School children do not go to it. There's no money to maintain a beautiful tulip cement sculpture that's in the middle of a field. It's really sad that this is not being taken care of in Croatia today. OK, I'm moving toward the end. Um, I want to talk a little bit about Auschwitz. We have quite a lot of testimony of survivors, certainly not the number that we have for Jews, but we have over 400 specific testimonies, survivor testimonies, at the Shoah Foundation in Los Angeles at the University of Southern California. Some of them are very long, some of them are very short. This one talks about Auschwitz, uh, about the transports to Auschwitz. We don't know how many Roma got to Auschwitz. We know certainly over 23,000, maybe 50,000. Many of them, as soon as they got there, like other people, were separated out. Those that were infirm and could not work were gassed immediately, and those that they thought could work were put separately. But what we do know, and this is very well documented, is that the Roma that were not selected out were put in a separate block, block B, in Birkenau, a uh, separate division of it, and it was called the Gypsy Camp, Sogoyner Lagen, okay? And the, the transports happened over a few years, and what was different about this camp was that families were together, okay? So the Jewish survivors, there are no Roma survivors from this particular 
night when this camp was exterminated, but other Roma did survive, and there were many Jewish survivors who talked about the gypsy camp. So we know it existed, and we know <coughs> what happened there. Now, in this photo, you can actually see on the ground is a kind of chimney that came from probably a wooden stove and went along the ground, and the Roma used it to dry out their clothing because it was wet all the time and moldy and stuffy and really horrible. So we have some testimonies about this, and what we have very well documented is the end, the extermination of this camp, which happened in one night. The evening toward the day uh, of August 2nd to 3rd, 1944, okay? And we know that um, about 3,000 Roma were killed in that one night. And the commotion, the screaming, because you can imagine families together and so on, is very, very well documented. One other thing I wanted to mention is this photo, which some of you might know, it was used all over European textbooks for the curriculum of the Holocaust. It was called The Girl with the Headscarf. For years, it was assumed it was a Jewish girl, because most people know about Jewish victims. A reporter from Holland in the 1990s did a lot of research and has confirmed that this is a Sinti girl, nine years old, transported from Westerbrook in the Netherlands to Auschwitz, uh, died uh, on May, uh, on August 2nd, that very same night, um, and until you know, the 2000s even, this was a photo used to represent the Jewish Holocaust without knowing actually that there are Roma victims as well. Another very, very famous survivor is Chaya Stoika, who comes from a family of Lovada. That's a subgroup of Roma who settled, uh, they came from Hungary in the middle of the 1800s, and they settled in Austria. Very, very um, well-respected family. Her father went to school. Her father was a horse dealer and had a very good trading business in horses. She was also schooled, and her brothers and sisters were schooled. She and her family were sent to many, many different camps. Some people were killed right away. Some people survived. But she and her brother went on after the war to document their lives before the war, during the war and after the war in a series of paintings and memoirs that are really striking. And she's considered one of the most amazing artists of this period. So this is one of the paintings about one of the collections by Truck. There's many. She did hundreds of paintings. And she wrote her own memoir. She wrote other poetry. So Karl Stoika, Chaya Stoika, much of it is translated into English, not all of it. She wrote in Romani, and then she wrote in German as well. You can find them in Germany. And there she is. Uh, she died uh, several years ago. But this is one of the transports with uh, the swastika. Okay. Another instance I want to talk about is the Leti pig farm, because Leti um, was also one of these places where uh, it was called a holding camp, and it was actually run by the social service agencies. This is interesting about some camps, that they weren't run by the Gestapo. They actually had to be even funded by local, local social service agencies. So there were several thousand Roma there, and of course the controversy I'm talking about is that it became a pig farm after the war. And until very, very recently, it was run by a private corporation making, selling pigs and making pork products, okay? In 2018, after lots and lots of lobbying, it was finally purchased by the Czech state for a memorial. But it is still in arbitration and being argued who's going to actually pay for a memorial. This is not a Roma memorial. This is a memorial to all victims of the Holocaust, including Jewish victims. And the Czech government can't manage to find any money to actually do anything, even though it's not a pig farm anymore. Okay? 
Another thing I want to mention is that there were quite a number of instances of people, quote, saving or, or protecting Roma without even consequences. So that means people could actually do that, but they didn't. Um, Gerhard Baumgarten makes the point in a lot of his writing that it is really impossible to imagine the Holocaust without the buy-in of local people. So here's an instance he talks about. There were two families of Austrian Roma, okay, in this little village. The decree came, all Roma must be deported. Have them ready by such and such a date. The mayor said, oh, but we can't live without our blacksmith. We're a peasant village. We can't go. Our horses need horseshoes. Our, our hearths need pokers. Our looms need whatever heddles, whatever they need. And the mayor said, OK, that blacksmith family, you're staying. The in-laws of that blacksmith family went, because they didn't have the right occupation. But there was no consequence to that mayor at all. He decided that family was necessary for the village. He gives another example of a factory in the neighboring town that employed about 200 Roma. And the factory owner just didn't send the Roma on the, on the assigned date. And actually, they survived the war. So there are these instances where people actually didn't even have to hide the people they were protecting. They just went on in their life. OK, I'm, I'm getting to the contemporary period, but there's one, one episode of the war I really have to mention. Because even among Holocaust historians, this is not given enough attention. And this is the episode of the forced deportation of Roma, 23,000, in northern Romania, the border area between Romania and Ukraine called Transnistria. It's like Moldova right now. So about 23 to 25,000 Romanian Roma were forcibly deported by foot and deposited in a forest to freeze, to forage, to be cannibals, whatever they did, just to get rid of them. Less than half of them survived. And still today, there's very little recognition in Romania of this period. So if this works, I will play you um, this one video that was produced in Romania. It's not very high quality, but it is about that period of time. So um, in Romania today, there's some research being done on this. But again, this is every step is a fight for, to get money, to get interest, to get recognition. After the war, what happened? And what is happening now? OK, a few minutes on that. No Sinti or Roma were called to testify in any post-war trials. OK? Eichmann actually did mention the murder of Roma, but it was not followed up. Nothing happened at all. Starting in about the 60s, activists from the Romani community started to call attention to this. There were um, demonstrations in London in 1979. The um, Sinti uh, contingent went to Bergen-Belsen and demonstrated. But this was a very important moment in 1980 hunger strike by Sinti and Roma at Dachau laying wreaths and not moving, like a sit-in. Okay, So attention, it was the Sinti, those surviving Sinti and their um, relatives, their you know, children, uh, who called the attention first to the Roma Holocaust. Okay, So some attention has been given. When Germany was divided in 1982, West Germany recognized the Romani Holocaust in, in a sentence. That's all. That's all they did. But it was a sentence. Okay, And the Council of Roma and Sinti in Heidelberg was formed in the 80s. And they've continued to be a very strong advocacy center. Okay, It took until 2001 for Auschwitz to have an exhibit that had something to do with Roma. Okay? 
And August 2nd became an unofficial day of remembrance from those early 2000s, okay? But it took until 2015 for the European Parliament to recognize August 2nd as European Roma Holocaust Memorial Day. That's the day of the destruction of the gypsy camp, quote, in, in, um, uh, in Auschwitz. Uh, 2011, Poland. So this brings up the question of why don't we have more recognition? What are the barriers? What's happening in the US? And again, the question of, is the Holocaust a uniquely Jewish event? Obviously, from my point of view, I would say no. But there are people who might argue with me. And there might be people who would say, we have to compare oppressions. I don't want to go down that route. Because first of all, to me, this is a genocide. And I think any scholar would realize that. And genocides should be compared so that we don't have them again, not to see which was worse or better or whatever. We need to collect data on all gen genocides. In the US, uh, in the 80s, when the Holocaust Memorial Museum was being formed, there was not one Roma in its council of more than 20 people. I think there's 15 or 20 people. It took lobbying for years and years to get one Roma on the council. The first Roma was Bill Duna from Minneapolis, a Slovak musician. After him, and he was not treated very well, according to him, and actually quite a number of Jews on the, on the council themselves were very upset. Uh, that was followed by one or two, two terms by Ian Hancock, the professor of Romani studies at Texas. And then in, it was 1999, I believe, no Roma at all. And it took another more than 10 years to get Ethel Brooks appointed as one Roma on the US Holocaust Memorial Council. And she took her position about two years ago. Okay, So Ethel Brooks of Romnichel, British Romani heritage, now sits on the council. Okay, So there are quite a number of places where you can learn about Roma history and the Holocaust. In the US Holocaust Memorial Museum, there is one section. And they're starting to do some scholarly interest. They had their first seminar on the Roma Holocaust. Since the 80s, just one. But they did have one. Okay, And that was last year. In 2014, 1,000 survivors, Roma survivors, came to a, the 70th year memorial service at Auschwitz, which was very important. And just last year, Britain formed a Holocaust commission uh, to study the Holocaust and to commemorate it in general. No Roma representatives were appointed despite campaigning, but they, one Roma has like consultative status. Okay. And in Germany, uh, it took many, many years to get any kind of public place of commemoration, many years after the Jewish memorial, museums, and so on. But in 2012, this memorial to Sinti and Roma victims was uh, unveiled. It's in downtown Berlin, fairly close to the Jewish um, memorial place as well. And there's a poem there. And in the middle is the yellow, uh, a, a triangle with Z on it for the Zigeuner. All, all the numbers for Roma had a Z before them for Zigeuner. Reparations are also a very patchy and unclear picture and very, very frustrating. There have been some reparations paid, um, but many funds have dried up. And those that were earmarked for Roma are very far below in funding what Jews get. In Romania, there's a huge campaign now to try to get reparations. It is hardly successful, but people are really, really trying. Okay. And just to bring you up to date on what's happening with Roma in general. Well, the socialist governments try to assimilate Roma and make them into socialist workers. So many of them had forced sedentarization, uh, taking away their traditional crafts. But they did have some state security in terms of social benefits. So for many Roma in the socialist countries, the education levels went up, and they actually kind of felt more part of society and the, their, their status in general improved. And now, in post-socialism, 
quite a few of them are nostalgic for the security of socialism, even though there were measures against them during socialism. And I think it's because things are so bad now. Uh, in many European countries, not only uh, the East, you had tracking of children into special schools. If you spoke Romani, it was assumed you are disabled. You can't speak Czech, you can't speak Hungarians, you're going to a school for the disabled. And that's a separate track, and you never get out of it. Okay? And in general, erasure from the school curriculum, which I've talked about over and over again, not only about the Holocaust, but that Roma exist, and that they are lo the largest minority in Europe. And just a few things about politics today. Well, I've already said there's 11 million uh, Roma, 10 to, 11, 10 to 11 to 12 million Roma in Europe today. The majority are in the European Union states, but they have the lowest rates of education, political participation, social integration, inferior health care, lifespan, housing. I've talked about unemployment. I've talked about poverty. Things are really bad for Roma, and they're actually getting worse with the rise of xenophobia and, and hate, hate speech. So physical violence and intimi intimidation. Plus today, with migration of East European Roma to Western Europe and the hysteria about refugees in general, and many of those Roma from the southern tier of Eastern Europe being Muslim, they have multiple burdens, okay? being refugees, being dark-skinned, being Muslims, being historic European others, okay? So we have lots of instances of specific targeting. Berlusconi fingerprinted all Roma to have a criminal database. So if somebody committed a crime, they would know who committed it, okay? That's very reminiscent of World War II, okay? French expulsions back to Romania and Bulgaria of Roma, even though that's part of the EU and is actually not, not allowed in EU policy. And other types of expulsions of Roma migrants back to non-EU places where European law doesn't apply. Many demonstrations. Some of you might know about the Blonde Maria incident from a few years ago. A blonde-haired young child, a girl named Maria, was found in a Roma uh, migrant agricultural community in Greece. And immediately, the authorities thought she was abducted, kidnapped, OK? This is this old stereotype. And it went all over the papers. This blonde Maria must be saved. Who are these gypsies mistreating her? It turned out she was an albino girl from a Bulgarian Roma family that was even poorer than the, the Greek family where they found her. The Bulgarian family had migrated to Greece to find better agricultural work and, and had become friends with this other family. And the other family said, why don't you leave the kids here? They'll have a better chance to grow up. The economy's better here. So they left their daughter there. So this was an arrangement between families. This had ramifications all over Europe with these headlines. As far away as England, Roma in England were being punished in classrooms because, oh, you, you, uh, you steal kids? Uh, well, then you can fight me in the classroom. You must be those gypsies we see on TV. Okay? And last month in March, false kidnapping rumors started in France. Uh, through Facebook, and there were 10 to 20 attacks on Roma migrant communities just last month. Okay? So you can look that up. In addition to far-right activists staging torchlit marches against Roma, against Jews, against Muslims, against immigrants, this is from Bulgaria. This is also in Bulgaria where the minister of um, I think for internal affairs, who's supposed to be multiculturally sensitive, called the entire Roma population insolent and not law-abiding. Okay, demonstrations. Here are signs in Bulgaria. Again, I go to Bulgaria a lot, so I have a lot of information. The nation should be against gypsy terror and invasion. Okay, and this is from Hungary. Um, this is the, uh, these militias that they organize to patrol villages to, quote, to keep gypsies out. 
Okay? And this is, again, becoming more mainstream. It starts out as right-wing and xenophobic, and now it's becoming part of centrist dialogue. So some of the challenges that we have in Eastern Europe, in, in Europe in general, are re-emergent prejudice, violence against Roma, plus Holocaust recognition, and current struggles for a normal, integrated life, labor, housing, education, and health. In the meantime, we have cultural challenges as well. The stereotypes are still rampant. This is a, uh, a band. The name of them is Kidnapped by Gypsies. Okay, And this is the new hipster combined with gypsy called the Gypster. Okay? So it says, with a heart moved by music, love, and art, free-spirited individual, uh, bitten by wanderlust, always on the move, never settling uh, is a must. Singing and dancing without a care in the world, um, bearded gents, obscure arts, and vintage goods. Okay? You pretty much have like everything <coughs> not mainstream now is gypster. Okay? Many music festivals in America with the title Gypsy Music with no Roma at all. A lot of people making money from the brand, the Gypsy brand. So there's quite a lot of mobilization now by Roma to claim their own representative strategies and their own culture and to have them on stage or them as scholars. So I urge you in my last few moments to look at some of the websites that you've seen here, not only about the Holocaust, but also about current activist um, activities going on, especially advocacy by Roma themselves. And the one I'm, the one I'm involved in right now is called the RomeArchive.eu. And it has sections on civil rights, on voices of the victims. It has a uh, music, art, literature, film section. And you can learn a lot about Roma through that. So thank you very much. And I'd love to hear your comments and questions.